Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller, an African-American, licensed psychotherapist, professor, diversity coach, consultant, and author. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias, anything that marginalizes and oppresses. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, we'll have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? Let's do it. Welcome back, sis. I'm back. Thank you for having me back. Absolutely. First and foremost, I want to thank you for your kindness and uh, willingness to reschedule with me. I really appreciate that. I know it was last minute, but I really appreciate it. Of course. You, you've done it for me before, so look. <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> you did, right? And I was like, oh, yeah. thank God she forgave me. <laughs> See, that's the that's the quality of kindness, you know. Yes. You never yes. know when you need it back. So that that's a great example. Thank you for rem- remembering that. Yep. Um, yep. Secondly, how have you been? I want to check in and just see how you are. Thank you. It's so beautiful being asked that question for of once, course. you know. Yeah. Um, how have I been? Honestly, I've been a little bit all over the place, but yeah. I will say. Um, I've been feeling very centered recently. I've been feeling very connected to God and um, just trying to connect to my inner purpose. <laughs> I don't know if it's because I turned 30. Like, <laughs> I'm Wow, just, that's an important one. I'm like just trying to find out like who I really am right now. So, um, but like earlier this year, I didn't feel like this connected to God and this like, at peace. Like there's still a lot of stuff happening, but I'm just at peace with everything, but it has been an interesting year. Oh my gosh. I feel this year has been a lot. (laughs) I know we're going to get into it, but I want to validate that leaving your twenties is a thing. It's a big deal. And so congratulations for making a 30 and to being open to a new perspective. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. It's hard for me to remember uh, 30 something years ago, but I do know that was a big one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what everyone keeps saying. And they're like, oh, get ready. I'm like, what do you mean? I have to get ready for my 20s. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say it like that. At, at 29, I quit my job and left Connecticut and moved to California for a 20 year journey. Wow. And I turned 30 in, in Los Angeles. So it's it's a year of you know, changes, I think. Yes. That's what I'll say. Yes. yes. Uh, so I know Wait, you've been- I want to ask you, how, how have you been? Oh. The last thank time you, we thank spoke. You for, thank you for asking. Um, yeah, there's been a lot going on. And, uh, you know, I just turned 64. Woo! So everything- <laughs> You don't even get what I tell you. You don't even look like you're 50. Okay. <laughs> she looked God good. God bless you. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. How, well, yeah, happy so, belated birthday. Thank you. Thank you. So it's been, um, you know, I'm about to be 65 next year. So it's another time of evaluation. You know, these milestones as you get older get smaller. Yeah. So it's like 30 and 40, 50. And then when you get in your 60s, it's like 60, 65. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, those milestones get smaller. So I have a lot of gratitude and still a lot of reflection. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Got to keep the reflection going. So thank you for asking. Yes. But I, I also know that you've been on quite the journey. And one of the things I wanted to ask you specifically about the journey you've been on is what's okay. the theme of the lessons that you've learned since you've last been on? Wow. That is a I know good question. Years. Thank you. <laughs> what, what is the theme? Because I know there've been many, so yeah. I'm just trying to, you know, get a theme that's, that's been consistent. For me, it's been being open to new things. And um, I think this past year actually has showed me how closed off I was before as a person, even um, just with my way of thinking and with my interactions even. And I think like in, 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 in all my recent things that I've been learning to be reflective um, and just 
live in the moment, but also also be more conscious. Because before I, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but before I felt like I used to just say whatever I wanted as soon as it came up, you know, or if I felt a certain way, um, that was just that. Now I'm more like, and maybe it's just getting older. Now I'm more conscious of how other people might feel, right? And and I'm more conscious of how someone might look at me uh, as someone who's supposed to represent the kingdom of God over here, right? Hey, h- how am I, you know, presenting myself? And I, I've just been more aware of that. And I've been honestly learning to be more kind. That's been the theme right there kindness exactly what you just said earlier you know Mm because it's like you said you never know when when you might need some kindness back and you you really get what you give out so i love that to give that out i love that and again i do think it's a part of the aging process you know every every reflection you have as you age offers you a new lesson but i'm concerned that that means there'll be no more videos about read the book read the book read the motherfucking book (laughs) And that does make me sad. <laughs> no, they're still going to keep coming. Because <laughs> they still not reading. They are still not reading. Okay. <laughs> oh, that one. I pull that one out every once in a while and just post it again. <laughs> yup. Yup. Oh my goodness. Can, can we talk about can we talk about social media? When are we getting to the oh. social media question? Oh, no, we're getting there. Wait, wait, wait. We're getting there. You know we're getting there. Yeah. All right. First, yes. first, I want to talk about something you touched on, which is, um, and, and I have my own version of this, so I want your perspective. What's it like to be an activist in white spaces, especially corporate America? That was a good breath, by the way. Whew. Damn near impossible. It's, it's, it's what I want to say. Um, De, uh, Denise, I'm going to be quite honest with you. I recently lost my job. Um, I'm sorry, I, but... I was let go. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sorry per se, because I think everything happens for a reason. And I think it was past my time to leave, you know? Okay. Um, but I say that to say, wait, bring me back to the question because I don't want to get off track. No, no, no. You're not off track talking about what it's like to be an activist in white spaces. corporate America and white spaces. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by damn near impossible is like, I'll give an example of where I was working, the place where I got let go. In that county, it's very white, conservative. Um, It's like further north than I live, about 40 minutes north from where I live, which is Frederick, Maryland. It was Hagerstown, Maryland. If you know about Hagerstown, you know about Hagerstown. Mm-hmm. Um, however, there were just certain things that I had to adjust to. Like, for example, they looked at me, uh, a 30 year old black woman in a director position, like who the hell does she think that she is? You know, cause that's not something that's common up there. Right. But I, I'm from Montgomery County. Uh, Maryland, which is a lot more diverse. I think we talked about this on our last episode, how I just assumed that everywhere was was like Montgomery County, and it wasn't. Um, so Washington County was complete opposite of that, clearly segregated, like, um, and just the crap I was dealing with internally, just with the white board members and Oh my God. It's just like from what I wore to what I said to me posting on social media, which part of my my job is marketing, (laughs) marketing director. It's 2023. I need these places to get like, get it together. But the thing is they say they want diversity, but they don't really want diversity. They just want a black face to continue doing what they've already been doing and, and pushing those BS white supremacist agendas. And I will never thrive in those environments. Like this last experience has pushed me further to just wanting entrepreneurship and just wanting to to really grow my own business because I'm just seeing that I'm going to have to fake it till I make it in those spaces because it's just, they're not for us. They're They're not. We can only like, we can only do so much, 
You know what I'm saying? So it's really discouraging. The pay is nice, of course, in corporate America. The pay is nicer, but like you also have to make some sacrifices. Like, well, I'll I'll go further than that. I I, I talk about the sellout factor. Mm. You know, we all we all have a sellout factor, and the minute we get in one of these jobs, we're selling out a part of ourselves. I yes. think the thing that's most important is to not sell a part of your soul. Yes. You know, it's fine to show up, code switch, do what you have to do, you know, bring down your energy a little bit to, you know, like assimilate a little bit into that white space. But it's different when you feel like a part of your soul is gone. Mm. That, that's, that's detrimental to oneself. Yes. Yes. And, and for me being, you know, Miss Young, Black and Aware, it's only so much I can take. <laughs> you, you, you understand? I, yeah. Like, I'm not like, I feel like some things that a normal person might let go. <laughs> Me being someone in the activism space, I'm like, mm -mm, I, I can't let that go, you know? Um, so yeah, and, and I feel like that is my problem with, with that space. It does feel like you're kind of selling yourself, like you said, you know, and mm -hmm. and I don't want to feel like that, you know? You know, like, well, I do want I do want to offer you another perspective, <clears throat> which is, you know, I've I've done it in in um spaces for a long time. And I did it through my 30s. And I did learn how to be better at what I do from that experience. I, I was didn't have the same drive to get out earlier, you mm -hmm. know, as you do. And so props to you for that. And well, I also want to show the other side, which is that there are things to learn by managing those environments. There is something for us in that. Mm. I don't think a lifetime of being in there. Right. But there is something in there to learn, you know? Yes. And and you're absolutely right about that, you know, because it like uh, being a part of conversations that I didn't think that I would be a part of, you know, or getting getting a certain exposure, you know, that, that our people don't get to get to have on a regular basis. And so I, I, I definitely don't take any of that for granted, you know, however, it's like you said, you, you got to take it with a grain of salt. Like mm -hmm. you can't stay there forever. It, it can't be a, not unless you start your own, you're building your own, you, you got to be very focused to thrive in those environments. Yeah. You have to figure out what your end point is and your yes. trajectory. And consider yes. that, you know, I got, I'm going to put in 10 more years. I'm going to put in five more years. You have to consider your trajectory when you are in those spaces for sure. Mm, yes. <laughs> I agree. Um, so speaking, go ahead. Do you want to say something else? Uh, well, I was going to say it's hard to, to predict any trajectory in what's just been happening from 2020 up till now. It's like, how do you even yeah. plan for the future? I <laughs> No, Nobody fine. knows what the hell to expect. That's just the, the exactly. truth right there. But life is too unpredictable to be uh to cling to a plan too tightly. Mm, it's so crazy that you said that because I I found out today that um my cousin's sister, um her her um fiance died. <gasps> And, you know, so it, it, it was crazy because I just liked her post a couple days ago of them at the pumpkin patch. And I'm like, yo, life is I, I don't I don't take life for granted because, you know, you just never know when it's your time. And I'm grateful to be where I am. I've shared with you where I come from. So I don't mm -hmm. take anything for granted. And this is why I sometimes just grin and bear it, because I know that there's a bigger purpose that I, that I have to get to, you know, and, and just being alive is a damn blessing. I could not believe when I heard that I said, no way. I'm so sorry. Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, no, thank you. And they had a six month old daughter together, Ugh. you know, it, it's just so heartbreaking, but it just goes to show like nothing is promised. Like you said, nothing, nothing at all. Yeah. You know, look, let's, let's, Let's think about that in terms of what your activism has been. What have, what have you been up to? What have you been spreading the word about? What's been your thing? I mean, oh. I follow you, so I know, but tell them in case they don't. <laughs> so, well, you know, you know, I'm kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. However, I feel like recently, um, well, not I feel like, 
let me share what I've been doing recently for those who, who may not have been following, you know, my journey for the past year. Um, I've been traveling the country uh, with a group of other activists, you know, um, nationally. They come nationally from different places. Um, and we've been traveling together uh, to work on a bunch of things, including uh just exposing police brutality and working with impacted family members, um, uh, exposing a, a company known as Southern Company. If you know, you know, but they are a huge power company that runs the power in Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, right? And post-2020, they have been taxing the hell out of Black communities, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people that are already you know, in poverty and, and can't afford these things. And it's, um, the issue is they're the only power company. People don't have a choice. It's, it's like, what are you going to do? Go without power, you know? So, so the people feel defenseless. They feel like, that, well, what can you do? So we were, we were coming down. We went to Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia um, to talk to the residents, get, getting them registered to vote because it's all politics. All these companies are paid off. They pay their lobbyists. And I, and I just wish that the people power that we knew that, that we have power, we have more power than we think. And the reason why they get away with a lot of this shit is because we just don't have time to be involved. We don't have time to go to town meetings and be on these Zoom calls and, and keep up with everything that's being passed. That's just the honest truth. That's why it takes people like what we were doing to bring the stuff that's really like y'all need to pay attention to this, to bring it literally to your front doors. And that's what we were doing. We were going around knocking on doors. Um, we were invited to a bunch of different um, events, one of which um, was a Netflix um it was a screening of, um, it was a movie about Africa town and, um, they found this, uh, boat called the Clotilda, which was, uh, one of the last slave ships that came to America. And they claimed that it never came come to find out they bombed that ship to put it to, I mean, the lengths they will go to cover up white supremacy and lies. They bombed the ship only for, you know, hundreds of years later, the scientists then dug it up and, and they found it. So, you know, it was this movie. If you can check it out on Netflix. Um, yeah, sure. And it was powerful because they had their family members there. Like the Africa town is in um, Alabama. So it, it, it was very um cool to, to like, witness stuff like that and see so much of the history in the South. Oh my God. The, the South has so much history. And then on another hand, I, I saw a lot of poverty in the South. And I was like, you know, like people will talk about other countries, but I'm like, I'm looking at America and I'm seeing some things and I'm like, yo, this is right in our backyard. This is right here. And, and so, you know, it, it it exposed a lot to me being able to travel, seeing different parts, meeting different black people, you know, it, it was awesome. And then also I was working with, um, or should I say collaborating with younger people. Now they really the young black in the world because they're youngins. They're like 19, 20, 21 through like 27. I was the oldest. I was 29. <laughs> I felt like the old head in the group. But, you know, it, it was also good because it came in handy in certain situations, being a little more mature, you know. Um, but, yeah, it's it's so much in the social justice space that will never make it to social media, you know, like, oh my, like visiting Cop City in Atlanta, for example, before they demolished it and um, in not Cop City, sorry, it was Stop Cop City. Yeah. Um, before they, you know, demolished it, visiting the site where they literally murdered um, someone for protesting against Cop City. He was unarmed in the forest. I mean, this is real life. They shot him 26 times. And so it was just such a, a, a wake up call. And then meeting other people who are just as passionate, people like you, you know, <laughs> who, who care about 
what's happening in our country and we're not letting up like, no, we didn't forget. We still remember. We're still going to keep calling you out and we, we need people like us. So, yeah. And thank you so much for saying that. And also, you know, I love that you went door to door. Grassroots is the answer, you know, and that's why I really push like Qasem, you know, Rashid, because it's so important that we understand the people who have a voice for us and we get people out yes. to vote. There's a lot of discouraged bodies out there who look like us and we have to get them out to vote. That, yes. That's a part of the past. So I'm really, really appreciate that y'all were doing that. That's amazing. Thank you. Yep. And we got a couple hundred people registered to vote. So, you know, I'm like, if that's, if it, we did something, you know what yeah. I'm saying? In addition to just meeting, like I said, meeting and connecting with those impacted family members. And when I'm telling you, like seeing those moms who, you know, um, kids shot by police and they still getting up and protesting and getting bus loads of people to come and support. I'm like, this is real life for people. And, and yeah, of course that takes work, but they're doing the work. So when I see a lot of, laziness you know a lot of people got a lot to say but they're not doing shit mm -hmm. we we know those people they have you know, podcasts but they're not doing nothing <laughs> it's also apathy though right i mean it's also apathy it's like there's a place of people just this is all i can do so that's all i'm gonna do and so mm -hmm. it's the apathy we have to have compassion for but also call out yes yes right exactly i want to ask you you know given all that you've been dealing with this year Yes. What what do you feel, this is a hard question, I'm going to preface it with that, but okay. what do you feel a sense of urgency about? Honestly, I feel a sense of urgency about the fact that they're banning Black history in our schools. And I don't think that there's enough of an outrage about it. I think that the the people trying to ban it are louder than the people who are, you know, claim they, they don't want this ban. But this is like, I don't think they understand the gravity of this because it's going to start there, right? They're going to ban it. It's, next thing you know, they're they going to ban them for real. And, and next thing you know, we're we going to get really banned for trying to spread the information that we're spreading. So I, I'm not thinking of it as just, oh, some some little laws. They're pa this is catching on in a lot of different states. Like, And this is 2023. Like, this is some crap you would hear about in the 50s, you would think. This is 2023, and they're literally, they don't want what happened in history to be taught. And and the, if that's not upsetting to people, like it might not seem urgent, but it is. And I'm very concerned. I'm like, because this this is where the cen censorship starts. Okay. And 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 I I honestly feel like, and <laughs> mark my words, <laughs> this is my digital footprint. There's gonna be a lot more restraints on social media in the future. We are like in 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 the early stage of social media where we still have a lot of user control. We still have a lot of freedom. And I believe that because of the power that the people are getting, they're going to try to shift that. As you already see it happening now with the advertisements, with, you know, they're trying to get you to pay for, for stuff now. It's happening. And so this information, they, they're going to try to make it as not accessible as possible. And that is alarming to me because I've learned the most about my history and my people on the Internet. Exactly. No, I'm with you on that. I'm with you. It is alarming. And I'm glad you brought that up. I want to ask you about a quote from a, a, a thing that you posted that, I, that I'm going to repost. White yes. supremacy demands the perfect victim. Tell me what you think about that. That was like, oof, yes. The, like, that one hit you in your soul. You know, because I, when, when I see other Black people um, and they're getting, you know, scrutinized. For example, the young woman that was shot and killed while she was pregnant for stealing you know, at the, at the liquor store. And the fact that people were still okay with what happened because she was stealing. I said, you got, they don't see us as human beings because 
for you to have no sympathy for a pregnant woman who got shot and killed for something as minor as stealing? I I just I it, it's it's like what is it you you talk about model citizen? No, you even got to be a model criminal if if you do something you you it's just like I I think about if something were to ever happen to me on a large scale and the picture they would paint of me. You think oh I know this person I know that to them I'm gonna just be a black woman. That's it, and so. I, I, that one really hit deep because it ain't no model nothing. You you could you could be like um what is his name? I cannot think of his name. Bless his soul. Johnny, oh thank you so much. He brought me so much. Oh Johnny. Oh thank sweet. Thank you. <laughs> so oh my goodness. Um I think his name was Elijah Mc McLean. Yeah. Yes, who right. was so gentle and and so loving and used to go sing to cats and shit. I mean, how do you harm a person like that? The idea that we have to be a perfect victim means that if you are, are <clears throat> I'm gonna have voice crack. If you are, the white supremacy can basically run all over you, and so we have to consider what that looks like. What does yeah. it mean to be the perfect victim? And like you said, this woman clearly stealing for a reason, really killing her is the answer for that. Yeah. You know, or even Charlie Russell and how oh. everyone acted like that was the end all be all for black women because one black woman lied. You, you yeah. feel me? I, I, it, we could pull up hundreds upon yeah. thousands of cases of white women lying. You, you you feel me? But no one ever took those cases and made it, you know, the new the new stereotype for black women. Not now we're not gonna believe no abductions of black women or or kidnappings. Right. That's crazy. You it you is feel crazy. Me? And 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 so the, like you said, there there is no, no none. In America, there's none. They will try to no. demonize in the world. You. In the world, except in this anti-black world, they will demonize mm -hmm. you before they try to give you grace. And that's there you our go. reality. Yeah. And I, I'm going to move on to another situation and ask you, what what do you know now that you didn't know before George Floyd was murdered? Well, let, let's even let's say that differently. Ooh. What do you know now that you didn't know the day he was murdered? Because we thought so much change was going to happen. So what what do you know now that you did not know the day he was murdered? What I know now is there were so many people who were not awakened. And um, for that to have been their first, you know... Um, like realization of what's been happening in America for years, you know, to, to black people, like we've been getting killed by these police officers. And George Floyd wasn't the first and there was many after him. And so what, what I realized, you know, was then everybody became an activist. JD, you know, we saw everybody post black squares. Everybody was, you know, posting little updates for a little bit for about a month, maybe two months or so. And, but you know what? I thank them for that because for me as someone who was, you know, um, pretty involved in the activism space before George Floyd, it was, to me, it showed the need for my presence, you know, okay. uh, online. And I said, because I felt like it was a bunch of imposters right? Mm -hmm. who, who didn't have a full understanding and also who were just like trauma dumping. Like, I hate that so much. I absolutely hate when people are just posting people getting shot or, or, or mm -hmm. it's just, it's traumatic. And I've said that traumatic. that's why it, even in my content, I try to throw some humor in there. I try to throw yeah. some, you know, just some black culture, some black history, because we're not just getting killed by cops that that's not Absolutely. you know that's not all we we exist for we are not a Absolutely. monolith and so you know george floyd to me it it pointed out why what i was doing was necessary 
because for the no, first it. time it was like a wow people are actually looking for for social justice stuff you know it was like a oh my gosh uh, here's my chance to you know put myself out there put my platform out there and for the first time i, I started taking young like and aware very seriously i was like yeah, you know, i love that I love that. I love that. I think that that's a that's a perfect lesson to learn from that horrific crime. You said oh, it, and I want to add on. I, I, you said it, and I want to add something to it. Social media can work for us or against us. How do you think we use social media to inform the work without desensitizing the work? And that's what you just talked about. Mm, mm. How do we do that? How do we use it to inform the work without desensitizing the work or the people? You know. I think this work takes a lot of discernment um, and some of it is, is trial and error, right? Uh, because, um, because I've been posting for so long and I, I've kind of had that trial and error phase with, with, with my platform where I'm like, okay, no, I, I think this is going too far or sharing too much. Right. Um, and, and I've just had to learn the ways to make the information digestible. Because like I said, even though these things are happening consistently, people are still human. Like we don't want to see that 24 seven, especially as a black person, you know, we, we, we live in a real life trauma. Then I get on my phone, I see more trauma, you know, it's, it's a lot. And so I do think when you run these platforms, it takes a level of discernment. That's why when, um, white people, you know, dedicate their platforms to social justice, they have to navigate very, you know, differently than we do because they don't even have that added perspective of, um, you know, lived, lived perspective. So right. I, I think just to sum it up, it, it takes discernment. It's not, it's not some, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, repost what other people post. I th I think that you have to find what works for you and what you want to highlight because there's all sorts of black issues we could focus on. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the list is endless. I, I follow pages that focus on law. So I follow one page called black girls surf, you know, they focus on black girls who serve shout out to them. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, there's a little way for you to advocate however you want to be, you just got to find what works for you and also use discernment because you're dealing with humans, not robots. No, I like that. No, I like that. I think that's great. Um, you've been sharing a number of videos about addiction and unhoused community. And, mm. you know, you've quoted that addiction is real. What, tell me how that's come up for you and why that's been a new uh, exposure you're sharing. Well, to be honest, um, it was someone that I was working with um, who was very open about her journey with um, addiction. She had an opioid, opioid addiction yeah. um, that mm -hmm. she overcame. And she was, um, I think, t almost 20 years clean. Um, uh, and so just her transparency. And also I learned that September was, you know, National Recovery Month. And I'm like, you know what? there's people out here that are really struggling with this. Like maybe people who maybe they don't look like the unhoused community where you can't necessarily look at them and tell, but they're struggling with those addictions. They're popping those pills to get through the day or, you know, whatever it is, you know, drinking liquor, whatever it is. And you can get addicted to a lot of things, including food, everything. So it was really to, show people that they're not alone, number one, and also just to share what I had found out, just doing my part. I found out it was recovery month. Now I'm sharing it with y'all that it's recovery month. I had no idea. So that was really um, why I was influenced to even look into that. I appreciate that. Um, and it's so important that we share what we find out and what we learn. That's what I love to do. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, you have been posting a number of times about Regine, Regine Shabazz. Am I saying that right? Yes. Right? Will you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so, so I honestly, I am not the most fit person to give the, all the details. It's really okay. my friend aesthetics. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Mm -hmm. It's my friend aesthetics, um, who is the, 
the person behind the Sleuth Gang or Die page oh, okay. um, that we sometimes collaborate with. Mm-hmm. But um, she is friends with her and I have just been elevating her yes, message. Yes. You know, there's another activist who, who needs help and needs support. I'm here to elevate the message as I hope my fellow comrades would if I needed something. So, okay. you know, she, I she yeah. believe I ha- is, um, is needing brain surgery and oh they're raising God. money just to, to keep supporting her while she's okay. going through that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Because I, I've been pushing the message myself and I don't know the whole story. So that's good to Thank know that she's an activist and she needs our help. Yes. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's pretty help? much the, the bottom line, you know, and, and also I, I connected recently with another activist. I believe his um, Instagram is I am Brooklyn. Um, and he just recently lost his mother, unfortunately, you know, to, to cancer, which I can relate to because I lost my mom to cancer. Right, and so, you know, I reached out to him and he was just so appreciative, you know, um, just having uh, someone else in the activism space check on him, you know, and, and not like expect something, expect information or, you know, anything like that. I just told him. I'm here if you need me, you know, if you need to, to call somebody, here's my number. Like, I don't know him from nowhere, but I feel like that's the type of relationships that we have to build, you know, with each other to build trust, to build community, to, to show that we got each other's backs, you know. We have to have each other's backs in this work. And yes. and I want to I want to start to really push the global majority as having each other's backs. You know, we we need to, we need to I want to too. Mission. I want to too. Mission. Yeah, it's but coming. you know, I I think we got into this last time. It's like there's still some sort of divide I I feel like between black Americans versus other people in the diaspora for a plethora of reasons. And I wish that it would stop. Like you said, we, we are the global majority. So (laughs) really it makes more sense for us, for us to stick together (laughs) and work together and collaborate because you, you, we we all experience the anti-blackness. So, so, you know, it's time, maybe we turn the, turn the tide and that can only happen if we, if we try to understand each other's experiences, mm-hmm. that's what it is. Because what one's like thinking their experience is better than the other, or you know, and and that's not the case. We're just different people coming together. You know. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I I definitely think that needs to be the mission moving forward is to really you know do what we do as cultures of the global majority, which is uh, collaborate and be collective. Yes. Amongst themselves. You know, I agree with you. Completely. That is until white hey. supremacy comes in and shuts it down, but we won't go there. <laughs> we won't go there and we have to stop. We have to stop sub- subscribing to that. True. You know, true. We have to stop subscribing to the fact that there is not enough power amongst us to finally ceased, ceased and desist. Right. I think, I think that it is time for us to know the power within and a big part of it. You and I have talked about this before. It comes with spending. Yes. You need to know where your dollars go. Ooh, come on now. They don't want to hear that one. (laughs) They do not want to hear that one. Yes. I need my people to let go of name brands. Lord, let it go. Let it go. Wait, we need a moment on that. You you spending thousands on Louis. They don't give a damn about you or your community. No, I could never. Like I I haven't reached that point in my life where I'm like spending thousands on luxury items. I just don't don't have that luxury. But if I did, I'm just like the a part of me is like we make stuff too. I would be going out my way to try to support my people. Which I do now with the little dollars that I have. You feel me? <laughs> so I, I but, but you know, there's something to that, right? We we can't we also have to blame blame that on white supremacy. The idea that we buy into something because it's been sold to us so strongly, mm-hmm. you know, that mm-hmm. we've been told the narrative and we've bought onto it. And now it's all about changing that narrative and stop stop we need to stop subscribing. You know, no pun. Look, no pun intended. 
<laughs> Always a pun intended. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, I'm trying to think of the term. Can't think of the term. <laughs> Come on, JD, help me. What's the term? What? When you plug, no, when you plug something in. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. It's intentional, like you said. Yes, yes. But yeah, um, no, you're absolutely right. We got to change, change how we look at stuff and actually believe stuff is possible. And you know, that's what makes, I feel like, makes me different because I'm willing to speak out when others are willing to stay silent. Like I picked yeah. the, I don't want to say picked the side. But I publicly spoke out on what's happening with Israel and um, Palestine because I feel like I, in times of like this, you have to speak out for what's right. And I'm not going to sit back and act like what, what Israel's been doing for years to, to this country. No, no innocent women, children, or men deserve to die. I, I would never say that. But what I am going to say is the ethnic cleansing, the 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 violence that these people have been experiencing for years, and, and none of it has been covered, you know, to at this level, it's 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 it shows you white supremacy again. Like y'all care about these people, but you don't give a damn about these people. So you know who I'm gonna speak up for? I'm gonna speak up for the ones who y'all trying to shut out their voices. They're trying to shut down their internet. They're trying to make the journalists have no way of communicating. It's not right. Well, you know, and and I appreciate you um, being candid about your perspective and your opinion. I also think that as people in the global majority, it is difficult to not have a racial trauma triggered when we're watching this happen. Mm. I mean, I have felt it and been very conscious of watching this happen and having an internal feeling of, you never know. Yeah. Yeah. No, seriously. And, and not even just that, I just feel like it should have been a wake up call globally because I feel like in America, we kind of live in this shell of thinking that nothing could ever happen to us, you know, only because we've kind of lived in this generation where we haven't really like, um, well, at least from my generation, I don't feel mm-hmm. like uh, we've experienced war like they did when it was Vietnam and World War Two, you know, and so we don't think that we're like. We think that, that, that nobody could ever attack us. And I think what that Israel attack showed is expect the unexpected, you know, like we don't know. We, we don't know. And that's why it's best to, 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 to know the Lord. <laughs> okay. Listen, uh, because listen, we, we just don't know. We think we don't know what. America has a lot of enemies, unfortunately. And and, and so I, I think as, as Black people, this is why we need to stick together. And this is why we need to understand what the hell is going on in the world. We can't just live in this in this little bubble because when, when shit hits the fan, you don't want to be clueless, depending mm-hmm. on the white man to tell you what to do. No, mm-hmm. even though, unfortunately, structurally, that's how they set it up. Exhibit A, Maui, right? Right. Those, yes. those, they, they had no choice but to depend on, 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 yeah. you know, the the government and the help from those people. It is so tragic with what, what's happening there. But that's a whole yeah. other story for a whole other day because I have my thoughts on that too. How can you not? Again, as as people from the global majority, how can we not? Even if we don't talk about it, how do we not feel it? Yeah. You know? and, and if people are so detached that they don't feel it, man, I'm a bit envious of them right now, but I'm also scared for them. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's going to hit them the hardest <laughs> when, when you wake up from La La Land that you've been living in. <laughs> True story. Yeah. So before I, before we, uh, before I let you go and before we talk about everywhere you are and oh, how man, you're going to I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> It's gone quickly. I know. Our time together goes fast. Yes. But wait, before we talk about all the ways in which you continue to change the narrative, I have a question for you. Ready? Final question. Okay. Should Black people stop saying the N-word as your white friend questioned? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. <sighs> so I... 
So I, you already, you know my response, but I'm going to say it again. I believe that black people using the N word amongst each other is completely appropriate. I think culturally it's something that we have, um, desensitized I guess you could say we've taken ownership of it you know it's ours and it just really bothers people that 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 it's ours and so a part of me kind of likes that too like I like that you you can't say this and, and you know very well you can't say you're not gonna dare say this okay and I kind of like that no I'm, I'm with you on that the other part of it is I need black people to stop letting people come to the cookout and saying things that they don't need to see, say that that just drives me crazy. And not checking them, and not right. checking them, or inviting them. I've heard white bodies say, "Well, my my black friends don't care." Well, that's a problem right there. Okay, that's, right there. Listen, that's the real problem. I'm telling that's you, I, I've I've learned through experience that white people are just they, they just don't know. Sometimes they really just don't know. Like they, I had this one coworker um a few years ago who invited me to a cookout and I should have known better, but I didn't know better. And me and my husband were the only two black people at the cookout. <sighs> okay. That's, that's, that's a barbecue. That ain't a cookout. <laughs> barbecue. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so uh, t- for me, I was just like, she didn't know that that would have made us uncomfortable. Like you, you thought we were gonna be cool with, it. and then they started talking about redneck something. I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> Lord, get me up out of this place!" Oh my goodness! Uh, but no, all right, long yeah. story short, it's we all ours. Been there. It's ours that word, and I want to keep it that way. And and until the majority agrees that it's offensive, which I don't think is a majority. I think it's a small percentage of us that think. Oh, that word's offensive. Most people that I know, young, old, black people, they use that word. I'm with you. And we I'm don't use you. it as, a, I mean, well, you know, it can be used in any any way, shape, or form. <laughs> it's true. It's true. My, my, my thing is, and then I'm going to let you give all your handles. Yes. My thing is, stop caring about what we do. <laughs> mm. Say it again. Say it louder uh, for the folks stop, in the back. I got a solution. How about you stop caring about what we do? when it comes to that and care about what we need and want. Which is reparations. <laughs> Let's talk about the anytime somebody bring up the N word conversation, I'm going to flip it back to reparations. There we go. There we go. All right. Tell us all the handles. Where can people find you? Get your services. Hire you. Yes. What does that look like? Oh, hey. Hire me. Yes. Hire your girl. Social media guru. Uh, AKA Miss Young Black and Aware at Young Black and Aware, all one word. Um, mm-hmm. I also um, am a part of the Free My People Collaborative. Yeah, Peep the Black Woman. We break in the mm-hmm. chains. Okay. Um, and and also, um, so follow Free My People with three E's. That's F R E E E, my people. Okay. And, um, yeah, who else? Uh, I'm going to shout out my girl, Aesthetics Sleuth Gang. I want you guys to follow her because she is also a, an activist and she keeps us informed. Sleuth Gang or Die. That's S-L-E-U-T-H-G-A-N-G or Die. Okay? Nice. Yes. And I just want to say thank you for collaborating with me on posts. You know, there was a couple people I just say, you know what? I'm going to shoot my shot. I'm going to see if we can collaborate. You know, your audience, my audience can see it at the same time. And so I appreciate that, you know, you were receptive to to that because I feel like um, we've both just been been benefiting from that and we're just exposing more to more people. Absolutely. And I'm going to reach out to you again because I got some stuff I want you to have handle for me. Okay. So okay. I'll, I'll, hit you, I'll, I'll hit you up on the on the outside and I'll let you know when we drop this episode, okay? Yes. I'm excited. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. And you know much. I love you, sis. I love you and, I, and I'm there for you. You know that. I, love I care you about too. you. too. And thank you. You That you are. You a real one. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> I love it. All right. Take care. I'll be in touch. Yes. We'll talk soon. Love you. Love you too. Bye-bye. Bye.